O oh, give thanks to the God of gods for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever to him who alone does great wonders for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Can you imagine, you know, here you're in the temple, you're, you're listening to this, and you've got an enormous choir. Just think about that. You've probably got them just divided, you know, so that you have the one part of the choir saying, to him who alone does great works, and another part, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. See, there's a refrain in here. This was meant to be sung, okay? So you, you think of a spe spectacle of hundreds of people in a, in a, in a crowd place and like in, that had magnificent surroundings like the temple. This is what was being done. Verse 5, to him who um, by wisdom and understanding made the heavens for his mercy and loving kindness endure for him forever. To him who stretched out the earth above the waters for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. To him who made the great lights, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his mercy and loving kindness rule forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. This is a powerful psalm of giving thanks. It was an example of the formal liturgy that went on in the temple where they would formally praise God. And it was a means that God instilled and, and inspired in the Bible to enrich and deepen the worshiper's relationship with God that would move. It was a formal acknowledging of giving thanks, of showing gratitude. And you know here from Psalm 136 here, if you went on to verse 10 to the end of the psalm, you're, you know, the psalmist in essence is, is encourages the reader to give thanks to God for what Jesus much later was succinctly summarized in Matthew 5.5. 5. Let's go to Matthew 5.5 5 here. Matthew 5.5. 5. And it's classically rendered here in Matthew 5.5 5 is what? Is from the Beatitudes, right? Beatitudes, when Jesus' famous, you know, sermon that he gave, distilling the essence so much of what Christianity, the, the new covenant relationship with God was going to be all about. In Matthew 5.5, 5, it's written, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And that's what this, the latter part, of really, of Psalm 136 is all about. It's the blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth the earth. It's not going to be the proud. It's not going to be the arrogant. It's going to be those who give thanks, those who can show gratitude. If you looked at the amplified version of Matthew 5.5, 5, it puts it this way. For blessed, it says, happy. You see, this is a, this is a more, you know, like we, we're not really sure in our time. What do you mean blessed? You know, what, what is this blessed bit? You know, that's not really so much 21st century language. But blessed means happy. There's another word they use. I, I like this word, but we don't use it much now either. Blithesome. Blithesome. You know, that's, that's, it's really a fascinating word. Joyous. It's spiritually prosperous. Spiritually prospered are the meek. Spiritually prospered. That's, that's to be spiritually prospered is to be with life joy, the Amplified puts it. Satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of whatever your outward conditions. That was an important statement. And you know, when you think back on 136, blessed are those, you know, who, who are blessed by God. They're going to be happy. They're going to be spiritually prosperous regardless of their outward circumstances. And the Israelites, when they were slaves in Egypt and even coming out and some of those things, it sometimes was difficult. But they were to give thanks because of this incredible promise. Blessed, happy are the meek. Those who are the meek is often tries not, you know, is the, the meek are not the weak, but they're the ones who are mild, who are patient, who are long-suffering. And in our society right now, we've got to be patient and long-suffering because the ignorance in our society now is just growing in by leaps and bounds. People just do not understand. Blessed are the meek, 
for they shall inherit the, uh, the earth. This is one of the things, and you, you think about this, this is when we realize this, when a believer realizes, it, it returns, it should return from us this gratitude, this appreciation, this thanksgiving to God. As I said, thanksgiving or expressing gratitude to God in the Old Covenant scriptures, and the Hebrew scriptures, was largely organized. And they had it, you know, officially organized, formally organized through the sacrificial system where you had thanks offering or peace offerings, which was a means of expressing your gratitude to God. There were psalms that were sung, just as we read right now, Psalm 136, of, of you know, of a congregation formally in the worship service to give thanks to God. But the scope and range of opportunity for the people of God to express their gratitude and thanksgiving goes far beyond what is formally prescribed in the scriptures or that were incorporated into the liturgy of the temple service. It goes and it comes down all the way to what an individual feels. And this is what something even all a sensitive Israelite in the past would have sensed this, would have understood this, that it would have gotten a personal deep reaction from him or her to express gratitude, to express thanks to God. And why? Let's go to Psalm 116. We we're going to see one of these personal responses from a psalmist. In Psalm 116, again, I'll stay with the Amplified here. It says, the psalmist writes, and this is from a first-person perspective. He's saying, I love the Lord. Why? I love the Lord because he has heard and now hears. He's heard and now hears my voice and my supplications. See, this is a dynamic relationship that the believer is having with God the God of the universe, the God of Israel. I love the Lord because he has heard He and now hears my voice and supplications because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, will I call upon him as long as I live. The cords and sorrows of death were around me and the terrors of Sheol, the place of the dead, had laid hold on me. I suffered anguish and grief, trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, save my life and deliver me. And he says here, and he goes to verse 5, Gracious is the Lord and rigidly righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he helped and saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. As we, you know, the believer here, the psalmist, he found rest in God. And you know what? This resonates very directly into the New Covenant Scriptures when you think about that. Let's go to Matthew in the Gospels. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Matthew 11, verse 29. Stay here with the uh, Amplified. Jesus said to the believers, he was saying to those who were listening to him, who were coming to him, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am gentle. You know, the, 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 the Amplified would say meek and humble or lowly in heart. And you will find rest, rest, that is relief and ease and refreshment and recreation and blessed quiet for your souls is the way the Amplified put it. Yes, return to your rest, Psalm 116 said, it would said, verse 7, O oh my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. And that's what Jesus said. When we learn of him, when we take Jesus' yoke, and a yoke was something, obviously, whether it's a picture of the yoke, I've said this before, but a yoke was, you know, it was an agricultural implement that you used in farming to plow. You didn't just plow with one animal if you wanted to go any place to pull a plow through the ground. You needed two, at least. And a yoke was meant to bind the strength of two animals Okay, two animals into one job of, of 
of accomplishing of this agricultural task of, of drawing a plow or pulling a cart or something like this. And Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. In other words, team up with me and learn of me. Because he's the lead. Any, any, in any yoke of animals, you have the lead and then you have the one that pulls with, that follows the lead. That's how it works with, you know, with oxen or these things. They always, uh, in, in that yoke of animals, there's one that takes the lead from this standpoint. But Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest. Because it's easier to pull together. It's easier to, you know, to pull together and to have another one there to add the strength. You know how it is if, you, you know, if, if during the winter your car uh, you know, slides off the road and you gotta push it out of a ditch or something. You know, by yourself, you're, you're probably, it's impossible or to push it out of a stuck place. But with you have a help with others, you know, at least one other person. It makes it much easier. I've had to push cars. I remember <coughs> they, they even start them with the batteries with the manual transmission car. You put it in second. And to push it by yourself sometimes seems very hard to get that car moving. But to, to push it in unison with others, you, it was it made it work. It made it, it, made it move. Okay, let's go back to Psalm 116. I want to pick that up. Psalm 116, as I said, as I stop there in verse 7, Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my life from death, verse 8, my eyes from tears and my feet from stumbling and falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Now look at this. I believed, that is, I trusted in, I relied on, I clung to my God. That's what it means to believe. It's to do all those things, to trust, to rely on, to cling to your God. That's what real belief is. I believed and therefore have I spoken. See, the, the belief, the faith results in an action. Even as I said, I am greatly afflicted, I said in my haste, all men are deceitful and liars. He said, oh, you know, you know what, am, what, is my, what is my purpose? I'm trying to, you know, I, I, I believe and therefore I have spoken. Of course, the writer of, of, of this particular psalm was in a leadership position. And obviously, he was, he was having to deal with sometimes people who were deceitful and liars. So what is the point? Verse 12, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? How can I repay him for all his bountiful dealings? Yeah, I might have frustrations right now in trying to do my job. Because, you know, like sometimes people are deceitful. They are ungrateful. They don't express their thanks or appreciation for anything somebody who is a leader in God's work might do. But... Yet he returned to his thinking, not to be negative, but to be positive. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Verse 13, what does he say? I will lift up the cup of salvation and deliverance. The cup of salvation and deliverance. And call on the name of the Lord. In other words, he's going to continue to preach. He was going to continue to show what God's way was all about. He wasn't going to let just a few, you know, who were deceitful, who were liars, who were ungrateful, discourage him to the point that he no longer continued. He had to be remembered to focus on it and to be thankful to God for what he, in remembering what he had done for him. Verse 14, I will pay my vows to the Lord. Yes, in the presence of his people as a public witness. I will pay my vows before his people. Verse 15, precious, meaning that's important. It's of no light matter. Precious to the Lord is the death of his saints, his loving ones. See, it's precious to God. Every human being, you know, death comes to every man or woman. You know, this is what we're appointed to. We're just physical beings. But for God, for those who are in relationship with him, in covenant with him, he says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. 
O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid. You have loosed my bonds. I'm not held by something back. We want to think of this from a New Covenant perspective. I'm not held back by bonds of guilt and sin. No, we've been set free, haven't we? Verse 17, I will offer to you what? What is the response for having been set free from these bonds? I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. In other words, publicly profess, publicly show, publicly exemplify in one's life. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. See, he is our God. Verse 18, I will pay my vows to the Lord, yes, in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Okay, this was, you know, so it was a public thing that he continued to show and to witness his thankfulness, his gratitude for what God, the peace that God and the promises of goodness, the grace that God had shown him. He was willing to do that. In the New Covenant writings, the Greek Bible, expressing gratitude and thanksgiving, you know, it, it, the emphasis and in, in the, the, the writings show that really we need to incorporate the uh, thanksgiving and the expressing of gratitude as an integral part of our lifestyle. It's part of who we need to be. We need to think about this. For Christians, our lifestyle of obedience to the word and will of God is offered, not done in order to obtain a blessing like salvation, but offered with our thankfulness. It's expressed. We offer our gratitude, it, it's our thankfulness is expressed and our obedience is offered out of gratitude for the grace of God that we've already received and for what is yet promised. This grace of God is wholly unearned. It's not something we earn, but it's our, our obedience to God is our response. It is an expression of our gratitude and our, great, our gratefulness, thankfulness for his grace. For the apostles, this is a consistent theme that because of God's grace, you know, we express our gratitude by obedience and in, in, our, in the, all the different ways of how this obedience will manifest our, itself in our lives. It's, it should be part of our lifestyle. Let's go to 1 Peter. This is the Apostle Peter here in, in his first general epistle. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. So I'll pick this up at first one. I'm, I'm staying here with the Amplified Version. Peter, an apostle. An apostle meant a special messenger, a special missionary sent from God, okay? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion, scattered, he says. When he uses the word scattered, it should create in your mind a visual image of the Lord of the harvest who has been sowing seeds throughout the world. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to the elect exiles of dispersion, scattered abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All these areas that were, they were near yet outside the borders of Israel, what we now know as is Turkey in all this particular area. So God had scattered his seed in this area. Verse two, who are chosen and foreknown by God the Father and consecrated, that means sanctified or made holy, by what? By the Spirit, for what purpose? These people who were scattered, who were sown in these different places, being chown and chosen and foreknown by God the Father and consecrated by the Spirit, for what purpose? To be obedient or unto, and uh, the, the, the lexicon would put it in their translation, unto the obedience 
the obedience of Jesus Christ, to be obedient to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and to be sprinkled with his blood. The image here is very clearly in the Old Covenant, blood was of uh, the animal sacrifices was sprinkled on persons and objects to indicate that they were sanctified, that they were set apart, that they were consecrated for holy use or the forgiveness of sins. You can see that in Exodus uh, 24, verses 3 to 8. When, you know, when they were initiating the Old Covenant, they, they had the, the blood of the sacrifice and the, Moses scattered it. He, he sprinkled the people with it. So these people who were sown, those who were the elect exiles, they were chosen and foreknown by God the Father, consecrated by the Holy Spirit to be obedient to Christ and to be sprinkled by his blood. The interesting word here, obedience, and in Strong's, this is, uh, the, it is the word 5218. Yeah, it's hupakoe, obedience. Literally, it means to, uh, to uh, the obedience uh, to Jesus Christ or unto the obedience of Jesus Christ. Literally, it's the submission to what is heard. It's the submission to what is heard. Obedience as a response to one who is speaking. See, Christ is speaking. He spoke from the top of Mount Sinai. He spoke to his disciples. He is speaking yet through his word. And this is his obedience, this is a mission to what is heard. The preaching, you know, Paul talks other places of foolishness, of preaching, but it's, it's, it's how God does things. He has revealed the information so we were chosen, we are foreknown by God the Father and consecrated, that is means made holy, set apart by the Spirit to be obedient, that is to submit to what is heard. And obedience is a response to one who is speaking, which is Jesus Christ. All right, let's go back here to verse two. I'm gonna break into it. May grace, that is a spiritual blessing, and peace be given you in increasing abundance. It is something that grows, this grace, this unmerited favor, and the peace that God gives. The apostle Peter is saying, may be given to you in increasing abundance. It is something that grows. It's a spiritual peace to be realized in and through Christ. It's this peace that includes freedom from fears, freedom from agitating passions and moral conflicts. This is something we need in this world. This is a world that truly has fear and has passions and moral conflicts. May grace and peace be given you in increasing abundance. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. By his boundless mercy, his mercy never failed. Remember that in Psalm 136, his mercy, his, he was teaching his mercy never failed. By his boundless mercy, we have been born again, begotten to an ever-living hope through the, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, by his boundless mercy, yes, we have this hope that he's, that he's provided for us. We are begotten, verse 4, into an inheritance that is beyond the reach of change and decay. That is to say, it's imperishable. It's unsullied and unfading, reserved in heaven for you. See, this is what we've been gotten to. This is it's an incredible promise and gift that God is giving us. And he says this in verse 5, to you, okay, this, this hope is being given, who are being guarded. The Greek here is it's like imagining your, 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 your city that's being garrisoned by these troops to protect you. You are being guarded. And imagine just like, you know, if you were in the Middle East right now, and there are people who call themselves Christians in northern Iraq, 
And they've been fleeing for their lives because their cities aren't garrisoned. You know, they're fleeing from ISIS, you know, these, these, these savage Islamic fundamentalists who chop people's heads off and do all sorts of terrible things, line people up uh, in ditches and, and just blow them away. So you who are being guarded, like God has put you in a city that's garrisoned by his angels, by God's power through faith, this faith, again, is God's inner persuasion. Till you fully inherit that final salvation that is ready to be revealed for you in the last time. So what is our response to this? Well, our response to this obviously should be obedience. The obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that consist of? There are many things it consists of, but I'm focusing on one aspect of it today, which we're talking about, which is our, you know, our joy in being thankful to God and to our neighbor. The opportunity, to have the opportunity to, be, to express gratitude. A typical letter from the Apostle Paul, you know, often opens with him thanking God for God's blessings, and what? Usually for the happy memories that Paul would have the people he's writing to. See, God would give, you know, he'd express his thanks, he'd express his appreciation and his gratitude to God for the incredible things he's given us, these promises of this, of this inheritance, this imperishable inheritance. But he also would give thanks for the happy memories that he'd have of the brethren he'd be writing to, God's chosen people. Let's go to Romans chapter, uh, let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. And we'll go to verse 4, staying with the Amplified Version. Romans 1 and verse 4. Breaking into the middle of what he's saying here at the beginning. And as to his divine nature, according to the spirit of holiness was openly designated the Son of God in power in a, which he, would, he was designated the Son of God, obviously, in a striking, triumphant, and miraculous manner. How? By his resurrection from the dead. So he's openly designated the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Yeah, that's a demonstration of power, all right. That's what motivated the apostles to do everything that they did. Most of them being martyred, except for the apostle John, who suffered you know, all sorts of banishment and problems, and even into his old age and rejection by some. They were willing to endure all of that. Openly designated the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, even our Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah. It is through him that we have received grace, God's unmerited favor, and our apostleship, the apostle is writing, to promote obedience to the faith. See, their obedience is an important part of Christianity. If you want to be uh, in, truly in the faith, you know, the whole point was we are receiving God's grace to promote obedience. That's not a message you're going to hear typically on the Sunday funnies. It's not. To promote obedience to the faith and make disciples for his name among all the nations. See, it wasn't just the Jews. Obedience was an important part if you were going to be a, a Christian. And this includes you, <laughs> you know, called of Jesus Christ and invited as you are to belong to him. Verse 7, to you then, all God's beloved ones in Rome, the Apostle Paul is writing, all God's beloved ones in Rome, called to be saints and designated for a consecrated life. Yes, it's, to be a Christian is not just a label. You are, you are designated for a 
consecrated life, just as Jesus Christ was designated the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. We're designated for a consecrated life, a life having received grace, God's unmerited favor, to promote obedience to the faith. That's our job. Grace and spiritual blessing and peace be yours from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, Apostle Paul continues. Getting his next point in now. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Wow. Paul is expressing gratitude. His gratitude for his spiritual neighbors, the Romans, whom he hadn't even seen yet. He'd, he'd heard about them. He was expressing gratitude, he had appreciation, he was showing thanks, seeing something positive and good. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Boy, wouldn't you like to have an apostle of God write that about you in your, you know, in your local congregation? You know, what a, what a great thing. You know, he's expressing gratitude. He is showing to love your neighbor as yourself. Is Expressing gratitude is part of that loving your neighbor. It's important to do. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Because the report of your faith is made known to all the world and is commended everywhere. Remember, Rome was the seat of the pagan Roman Empire. So it was a seat of power of great evil. It wasn't a great place of spiritual innovation, <laughs> except for good. Verse 9, for God is my witness whom I serve. Paul's saying he serves God with my whole spirit. The, the way they amplify it says rendering priestly and spiritual service. Whom he serves with my whole spirit in preaching the gospel and telling the good news of his son. How incessantly I always mention you when at my prayers. He's giving God thanks for these people. He expressed it to the people he's expressing to God. It's building his relationship by doing this both with God and with the, with the, with the people in Rome. The brethren who are living at Rome. I keep pleading that somehow... By God's will, I may now at last prosper and come to you. For I am yearning to see you that I may impart and share some spiritual gift to strengthen and establish you. That was Paul's goal. That's what he wanted to do with the, with the Romans, to strengthen them and to establish them. And he was part, one of the ways he did this was by expressing his gratitude for them, to show that they were appreciated that they were valued. He didn't just take them for granted. <laughs> you know, who are you guys? You know, show, I'm the great Paul. If you want to come hear me, you know, he didn't do it from that approach. Verse 12, that is that we may be mutually strengthened and encouraged and comforted by each other's faith, both yours and mine. That is part of the reason why we show our gratitude. It is strengthening. It strengthens both parties. It strengthens expressing thankfulness to someone else. It strengthens them. It encourages them. It comforts them. It builds them up. Both the one who is giving it and the one who is receiving it. That's part of the reason why we do it. And we live in an age with expressing of gratitude for, for each other is, you know, few and far between. It really is. It's not part of our age. Very few, you know, it's, it's, most people do not express gratitude for somebody else for, for what they do. It's, it's rare. It's, it's getting increasingly rare in this modern society. What we see here in, in what Paul is writing to the Roman as he's opening here in this first chapter of Romans, we see how Paul's gratitude to the Roman brethren you know, is virtually indistinguishable. He's, in, he's putting it side by side with his gratitude to God. You know, that's an important key. It's important to our lifestyle as a Christians. We have to think about this. We have to participate in this. And if you look back here again in verse, verse 5 here in, in Romans 1, 
He said, it is through him that we have received grace. Okay, we received grace through Jesus Christ and our apostleship, okay, our commission to serve, to promote obedience to the faith and to make disciples for his name's sake among all nations. And this includes you called of Jesus Christ and invited as you are to belong to him. It's an incredible invitation you and I have been given. It's an incredible invitation. And you, because we've received this grace, we, yeah, our thankful response to this grace should be our obedience and action, fulfilling God's will, remembering to express gratitude both to God for his grace and to our brethren who are called with us, who serve with us. You know, a child needs to be taught to say thank you. You know, any parent who has a child, you know, the moms and the dads, they, they, they have to teach the child to say thank you. It's an important part. I mean, it's, it's something you must be taught. And it's not only are you teaching it as a matter of form, just because you're supposed to, you know, it's a social pull-up. No, there's a reason why you teach a child to be thankful, to be grateful, to acknowledge something that is, you know, that benefit or something that is done for them, this gift. Because why? Because it enhances the appreciation of what is received and the child's relationship with the giver. Now I know some of my nephews, you know, I'll, you know, I, I guess <laughs> I said I guess I won't say, but you know, or maybe I will anyways. But you know, it's important. Any grandparent wants to, you know, if if they give a, a gift to a, a grandchild or, or a niece or whatever it might be, they appreciate hearing some thanks, even if it's just a short note. But to say nothing, it means what? Is there any appreciation for what is received? There is certainly not much of growth that's taking place in the relationship between the giver and the givee, is there? In fact, it does just the opposite if there's no appreciation or gratitude that's expressed. No one likes to be taken for granted. God doesn't like to be taken for granted. Neither the moms and dads or grandparents or anyone else. A child is taught to say thank you, not just because of form, but it enhances the appreciation. It focuses on some, some thought some reflection on what is received. And by showing this appreciation, it enhances the relationship between the one who receives and the one who gives. You know, this is part of the reason why under the old covenant system, welfare was given by individuals directly to the individuals who needed it. It didn't go to the state and then the state just doled it out by mass numbers, you know, unseen to all these people. It doesn't have the same effect. There is not the appreciation for what is given and there's not a development of a relationship between the giver and the givee. That's one of the major and functioning problems of this modern welfare system that we have. God's welfare system was totally different. It was the individuals were required, you know, once every three years they gave what is third tithe. They gave help when it was needed and it enhanced the relationship and built the community bonds between the one who received and the one who gave. It created solidarity in the community and we don't have that because we don't do it in our modern Western worlds. It's a, it's a fundamental principle that God teaches. You teach someone to be thankful and you encourage it because it, it enhances the appreciation for what is received and builds that relationship between the two people involved, the one who receives and the one who gives. And it encourages and helps them both in a way that is far greater than the benefit that is material benefit that is conveyed. 
It's this way in spiritual matters, too. If our relationship with God and expressing it enhances our relationship and with each other. Remember, we're to love God. That's the first commandment. With all our heart and soul and mind, and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. You know, that's the, that, these are the, the two most important of the commandments. Those are the great overarching principles. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Take a look at another epistle of the Apostle Paul. <laughs> epistle of the Apostle Paul. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. I'll read this in the expanded Bible, Bible version. Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian brethren and he said, So encourage each other. Encourage each other and give each other strength. That is to build each other up. And one of the prime ways you do that is by showing gratitude and appreciation when you help each other. It's extremely important because it builds again an appreciation of what is given and it builds the relationship, the personal relationship between the giver and the receiver. Encourage each other and give each other strength just as you are doing now. Okay, so Paul was actually complimenting them. He was complimenting them. Verse 12, now brothers and sisters, we ask you to appreciate, expanded Bible says, it says acknowledge, respect, those who work hard among you, who lead, or care for you in the Lord, and teach, that is, instruct or admonish you. Respect, that is, regard them, esteem them, respect them with a very special love because of the work they do. Live at peace with each other. And of course, if you show gratitude, if you show thankfulness and appreciation when you do different things, it certainly facilitates living at peace with other people. It's like, it's like the oil that just makes the relationships and, and people, you know, working together. It, it smooths out all the bumps and the friction. We ask you, that is, we exhort or encourage you, brothers and sisters, to warn, that is, admonish or rebuke those who do not work, that is, those who are idle or in, undisciplined. Encourage the people who are afraid. Anyone who's apprehensive or faint-hearted or discouraged. Encourage the people who are afraid. Help those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. Be sure that no one pays back wrong for wrong. You know, we don't pay back evil for evil. But always try to do what is good for each other and for all people. To pursue what is good. And expressing gratitude and thanks for things that we, you know, that somebody does for you or you do for, you know, when, when you do something else. This is an essential part of that. This is how we build those relationships. We would have probably in the Church of God a lot less strife. We would have a lot less fractiousness if we followed these simple scriptures that the Apostle Paul wrote out. I know. I've seen. I've lived. I see how it's played out. Congregations or groups that don't respect those that lead them, who work among them because of the special work they do, they eventually split up. It makes for a problem. Some of these things are, you know, God is very serious about what he says and their consequences for not obeying them. Verse 16, always be, always be joyful. That's always rejoice. Always be joyful. And how can you do that in spite of the circumstances? Well, sometimes you, you do have to look to the promises. You've got to stand on the promises, as the song says. Standing on the promises. This inheritance that's reserved for us, undefiled, untarnished, incorruptible, at the throne of God. Always be joyful. 
pray continually, that's without ceasing, and give thanks, whatever happens. That is what God wants for you in Christ Jesus. He wants us to give thanks. You know, the last time I talked with you about this subject, we talked about Eucharistia, where we get the whole idea of giving thanks, the whole idea of what much of the Christian world has put in there for symbolizing the Passover, the taking of the bread and the wine, is of gratitude. But here, you know, where it says, where the Apostle Paul is talking about, and give thanks for whatever happens, that is what God wants for you in Christ Jesus. That's God's will. That we give thanks and whatever happens. Here, giving thanks is the, the, the Strong's uh, word, the Greek word is 2168, it's eucharisteo. It's a verb. It's, it's a verb. It's acknowledging that God's grace works well. That's the, way, that's the way the lexicon defines it. Give thanks. That's acknowledging that God's grace works well to our eternal gain and glory. Give thanks. Be thankful for God's good grace to you. And we pass it on, see, as even the saying goes, to others. We're giving thanks for our brethren. It should be a part of us. Always be joyful. Pray continually and give thanks for whatever happens. That is what God wants for you in Christ Jesus. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You know, this theme was very important for the Apostle Paul and all the Apostles. How giving thanks and showing gratitude, how it, in, how it builds you know, our appreciation for the gift that is given us, the grace that God shows us. And it builds our relationship when, when we give thanks to God. It builds our relationship with Him and with Jesus Christ. It builds our relationship when we show our gratitude to our brethren to our leaders, to those who serve among us. As I said, we'd have a lot less fractiousness if we had a lot more giving of thanks and showing of gratitude. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. Apostle Paul says this, It is written in the Scriptures. And what's written in the Scriptures? Well, I already quoted it from Psalm 116. <laughs> It is written in the scriptures that I began speaking about earlier today and, and I read to you. I believed, so I spoke. Our faith is like this too. We also believe and so we speak. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and will bring us together with you into his presence. All these things are for you. They're for your benefit. So that the grace of God that is being given, that is the grace of God that is expanding, the grace of God that is increasing to more and more people, will result in what? Will bring increasing thanks to God for his glory. See, it's a way of showing appreciation. It's a spiritual growth. And because of it's increasing our giving of thanks to God, it increases, it, it helps us enormously spiritually because it, we gain in the appreciation of the gift of what he's giving us. And it builds our relationship when we give thanks because God knows how much more we're appreciating what he's doing for us. He, it draws us closer to him. And we're fulfilling, we're being obedient to the will of God and giving him thanks in whatever happens. This is what God wants. It's God's will in our lives. All these things are for you. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15, all these things are for you so that the grace of God that is being given Expanding, increasing to more and more people will bring increasing thanks to God for his glory. Let's close with a scripture here in 
Philippians chapter 1. It's almost like, you know, Paul always had to get in this, this whole, in, in, you know, he had to had his, his readers, when he sent out his letters into the right mindset, he wanted them to do this because it is so important for us as Christians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I'll read this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. Think about what he's just done here. I give thanks to God. Okay, he's expressing his appreciation to God for my remembrance of you. And he's showing gratitude to them at the same time. He's giving, he's giving, he's showing his appreciation of thanks to God and to his brethren at the same time. How strong is those relationships being built? It's a right angle. Very strong. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. It's masterful. Always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Let's give thanks.